Good afternoon, friends. It's a pleasure to welcome you again to uh, Afternoons with an Author, a show which has now gone on for the last two years. And we're delighted that we have today a wonderful book, Indra, by a wonderful author, Utkarsh Patel, who we can see. And our lead discussant today is Shalini Rao. Shalini uh, is with us at the Valley of Words. He's been curating the Iti Nritya and the Iti Natya uh, with us for the last three years now. Uh, this program is a joint effort between the National Digital Library of India and the Valley of Words. We are grateful to Karwal Post, Technopark, Green Panel, Coal India, ONGC, Incredible India, Cello, REC, NEFED, Uttarakhand Tourism, because a lot of people get together to, to get this show together for you. Uh, so, friends, uh, Utkarsh is a professor of mythology. And when I was reviewing his book, it was very interesting to know that now we have departments of mythology. You know, uh, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, it's absolutely great to have you with us, Utkarsh. And uh, I'm sure Chalini will also quiz you about comparative mythology. And, you know, just before this, uh, for all our listeners, you we were talking about Dev and Zeus and Zeus and how these things happen. Uh, so it's a great uh, honor to welcome you, Utkarsh. Uh, this My is his fourth book in the series, you know, starting with Chukla. And Shalini has read all his books. Shalini is totally impressed with his books. But when Shalini is impressed, it doesn't mean that she is not critical. So Shalini is a very critical and a very appreciative reader. Uh, and so it's a pleasure to now, you know, get this very interesting conversation going on between Shalini and Utkarsh. Uh, do let us have your questions. You can uh, send them to the uh, send them to the message box on the Facebook, or you can you know uh, send a message to Tanya, or you can send it to me at nine eight six eight five zero four zero four one. So the next thirty seven to thirty eight minutes over to you, Shalini and Utkarsh. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So Utkarsh, uh, uh, your first time here is a very very special. My first question. क्योंकि आप प्रोफेसर ऑफ कंपैरेटिव मिथोलॉजी भी हैं बॉम्बे यूनिवर्सिटी में माय फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन टू यू इज द इंपॉर्टेंस ऑफ मिथोलॉजी टुडे व्हाई शुड आई स्टडी मिथोलॉजी व्हाट विल इट गिव मी यू नो द फर्स्ट थिंग दैट वी मस्ट अंडरस्टैंड इज दैट मिथोलॉजी यू नो इट्स समथिंग अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट पार्ट ऑफ वंस कल्चरल हेरिटेज सो जस्ट एज वी वांट टू गो एंड चेक आवर मॉन्यूमेंट्स जस्ट एज वी वांट टू गो एंड चेक आवर बिल्डिंग्स we need to understand where we have come from these stories are basically a mirror to the society of the past and it tells you how the society was not necessarily everything was right then not necessarily everything was wrong then but from where have we come to now that's that's a very important part of our cultural heritage and that you must know that i think everybody should know and especially when you look at the whole subject of mythology it is so rich in kind of giving a peek into the past wherein you understand how people thought how people saw how people envisioned something this whole concept of uh, you know religion for example you know in many of the religions mythology is the foundation of some of these religions to understand the religion better sometimes these narratives actually help you to understand yes thousands of years have passed some of the stories might have lost their relevance because we've you know science has taken its place but having said that there is no doubt about the fact that the richness of the text exists even today like if, i'll give you a very simple example we all know that you know man man uh, you know uh, we know about evolution theory we know about the big bang theory we know about it all and every kid has probably studied it you would have studied i would have studied it but when we study the idea of a creation myth in in mythology and then you see that there every culture worth its salt has a creation myth which goes on to show that it's not only the evolution theory or the people who uh, gave us the big bang theory who were concerned about how we came into existence early man the primeval man was also concerned about where we came from where did the sun come from where did the moon come from what is thunder so on and so forth and man since then has been trying to get these answers those answers are form of a story because storytelling has always been the bedrock of any 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 society any culture so everything is always explained through uh, a storyteller i mean go and tell a four year old kid kid jhoot bolna galat hai hai the message doesn't 
twice booked well, right? So you you have to tell a story to tell him. I mean, who doesn't know remember the Tiger Tiger story, which we must have heard, you know, even before we went to school. But you see, the storytelling as a medium is important, and myths have always followed this whole thing about storytelling. And the, the, this just shows that people were seeking answers right from then. And I think the study of mythology helps us to sort of understand the culture and, of course, take charge of the heritage, which is uh, languishing at the backyard. And why not? Right. Very interesting. Now, um, coming to Indra. So Indra is a hero. He's a hero that, as we have known him, a Deva. And in your book, it's Indra the hero. So there's a concept of hero myths. Hmm. So could you talk about it a little and connect that to Indra? How? Why Indra? Why did you choose Indra as the hero of your book? Okay. You know, in, in mythology, we have a whole lot of theory about heroes. You know, look at any mythology. And rather many of us who have probably got interested in... Uh, the subject of mythology might have been, you know, in, in sort of an awe of certain hero, be it a, a Krishna, be it a Ram, be it an Achilles, be it, uh, you know, a Hercules. These are the people who have been kind of a beacon of light, uh, you know, for, for cultures. We've looked up to them. If you're, if, if you were from Mesopotamia, you would have looked up to, you know, Gilgamesh. If you were from Persia, you would look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, Shanama or Rustam. And Sora, these 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 were heroes that people looked up to. In India, we look up to Ram, Krishna, you know, Karna. So many heroes we have. These are the ones who actually tell us how to go about doing in, things in life, how to how to look at life for that matter. So heroes are important, and every culture, you know, will always talk of hero myths. So hero myths are very very important when it comes to uh, you know the study of mythology. Coming to why did I choose uh, Indra? Because I, I feel. You know, when I was doing my uh, studies of uh, mythology and when I was uh, writing these different books, I always felt that amongst all the gods, if you look at the way uh, Indra uh, has been treated, it's quite an interesting phenomenon. Here is a person who is a hero in Rig Vedic times. You know, there are more than 220 shlokas dedicated to him in Rig Ved and collectively about 330 plus. Here is a person who's absolutely eulogized for his, uh, you know, for his escapades, for his, uh, uh, you know, battle uh, uh, worthiness. The same person post Vedic era is made a caricature of. He suddenly, uh, you know, a, a persona non grata. He he's everybody's uh, butt of jokes. So what happened? Just and that's what intrigued me to think that how how does a person who's risen to fame falls from grace and uh, it, it ended up being a study and uh, you know it, it ended up being a research paper for me but then I thought that to reach out to larger audience to tell people that you know it's not that he, he was that kind of a characterless person as uh, you know in the Puranic times we've made out made him out to be nor was he an insecure god as we've made him out to be you know if you look at the Puranic times I mean let me call it post Vedic times you know all the narratives is so insecure you know, he's been relegated to just sending apsaras uh, from the heavens to disturb the penance of rishis uh, on earth. Is, is, is that what a Vedic hero uh, ought to do during the post-Vedic period? So there is something. And it's that something which I, tried, uh, which I have tried to sort of portray through this book to explain that every hero has a rise, uh, you know, however it is, but it definitely has a form. Yeah, but here uh, you know, he also took on from Varun, right? So Varun was the person, and Varun was in many ways Indra was the antithesis of Varun, right? Agree, but and Varun then, was never made fun of. Varun was never been made fun of. He remained, he relegated in the back burner kind of a thing, but he's never ridiculed. He's never made fun of. Whereas Indra gets ridiculed. No, Indra's I think that's made fun very of. Well. Yeah. yeah. In fact, this answers my next question, which is. Uh, the difference of opinion between Varuna and Indra, because Indra is this rebel who wants to question traditions, and Varuna is this sort of patriarch who wants to uphold the traditions and you know wants to uh, take care of his community, so to say. The Shunya Shaper story, which is um, I must ask our viewers to read this book. It's very interesting. There are some very interesting stories. The Shunya Shaper story, with Kirsch, if we talk about it a little, it is uh, it talks about 
the difference between sacrifice and killing, which I found really interesting. You could narrate that story a little. So the story of Shunashep is interesting. Uh, there is this, uh, you know, aging uh, king who doesn't have an heir, and uh, you know he he prays to uh, Varun and asks for an heir. And at that stage, he says, "If you give me a son at a particular age, I will sacrifice. Uh, I will offer him as a sacrifice." Uh, Varun grants the wish. Uh, the the king and uh, you know the uh, queen they have a child, but when the child is of age, you know obviously the child learns about the fact that he he is now to be offered as a sacrifice. Obviously, he doesn't want to be sacrificed, so he leaves the kingdom and he goes uh, in a forest. In a forest, he finds an absolutely poor Brahmin, you know, with three sons, and he deals with the Brahmin, saying that instead of me, why don't you lend me one of your sons, and he gets sacrificed, and I give you, I think, hundred cows, so that you know his poverty is also gone and it's taken care of, and you know a substitute has been offered as a sacrifice. So the uh, Brahmin is very happy; uh, he agreed immediately. Only to only to realize that he didn't want his elder son to be sacrificed because he, uh, you know the elder son was very close to him, and uh, the mother didn't want the youngest to be sacrificed because the youngest was very close to the mother, and that leaves the middle son, and he's quite disappointed to learn that he's neither his mother's favorite nor is he his father's favorite. So the king dealt with uh, so the uh, uh, what do you call sorry uh, the Brahmin offered his middle son. In the meanwhile, uh, you know, the middle son had uh, prayed to God and uh, sort of said that, you know, bail me out. And ultimately, you know, the gods come together and bail him out. But he doesn't want to go back to his parents. Okay, and that's how the Sunna Shaper story kind of ends up. Because there's a lot of debate and a lot of conversation, you know, about who's closest to the father and why, who's closest to the mother and why, then what happens to the middle son. And, and, and it's a classic uh, problem when there are three children in a family. You know, you'll always find this uh, uh, battle happening. So, you know, myth has taken up from there. Now, if you look at this, uh, the clash between Indra and Varun is classic clash of generations. What is right for uh, the, the, uh, the first generation need not be right for the second generation. You know, it's a, you and you don't have to go very far to see this clash. You'll find it in every household. You know, the son doesn't agree with the father. The next generation doesn't agree with them in many, many respects. And here, if you see Indra's questioning and, and this whole concept uh, is brought in to say that somebody needs to question the past, because if you are not questioning the past, there is a possibility that you will perpetuate the wrongs of the past too. Now, if a man has prayed for you know years for a son, how logical was it to offer the same son as a sacrifice to 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 the gods? Does it even make sense? And if it even if the father did it, does it make sense for the gods to accept it? Here is a man asking for a child, you know, sort of uh, saying that please, even at this old age, give me a son, and then you accept the son as a sacrifice. I mean, it doesn't make any kind of a sense. Needless to mention that these stories have been put in to spark a debate. Let me be honest about it, that in mythology, a lot of these stories are debatable. They are concepts for you and me to also evaluate to see that, are we still doing this? Or is this, is this logic changing at certain point of time or not? And the clash, you know, which uh, 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 you know, Indra and Varun end up with is just a classic change the change of generations how the new generation is not able to see eye to eye with the previous generation what was fine for the father is not necessarily fine for the son In, if you look at the earlier generations you know our fathers would have if they were working they would retire from that organization after 30 40 years have you seen a young uh, new generation a uh, young stays in a company for more than five years Forget about retiring from the company. Now, this kind of change, this child, the son doesn't agree that he needs to continue in this company forever till he rises at the top or he doesn't. So we'll find this kind of a conflict of generations in everything. And Varun and uh, Indra is classic uh, generation. And also remember that the society is changing. In, in the conflict, you'll find the society is changing. The rule-based governance is not working. That means the rules have become archaic. 
See, today we are facing a lot of those kind of problems because even in our country, we have some archaic rules, right? 18 something, 17 something, the British era rules, they need to be changed. Otherwise, we, we are facing problem. And I think somewhere Indra is raising those kind of issues that this rule doesn't make sense. So if the time has changed, the rules need to change. And I think Indra is just trying to raise that in these kind of conversations. So a story is very interesting in Uttarash Afi's book, Ahilya. I had uh, first heard of Ahilya from Ramayan. That's most of us know Ahilya from Ramayan. And uh, now this book, uh, your book, Indra gives a different perspective to Ahilya. Now in both the narratives, Ahilya becomes stone. She changes into stone. Um, but people's view. So when I read the Ramayan story, my my thoughts or the way I looked at the story was very different. But when I read your book, I saw Ahilya in a very different light. So uh, my question to you is, is this story inspired by Ramayan to give a perspective to Ahilya's pain and agony? Uh, yes. Uh, I have taken the original story is from Ramayan. The story is first mentioned in Ramayan. And in Ramayan, Indra does not come in a disguise. You know, pro uh, popularly, we are aware of the fact that Indra comes in a disguise uh, early in the morning. That is the Brahma Mohurta. And, uh, you know, uh, insists that, you know, he wants to make love. And Ahalya agrees. All that has been happening much later during, uh, I would say, the 12th or the 13th century, you know, when the Katha Sarit Sagar took the same story and changed it, right? So the whole disguise and Ahalya being cheated is a much later development. In Ramayan, very clearly Indra comes as Indra and Ahalya goes ahead recognizing that this is not my husband, this is Indra. And if you see in different texts, which I've tried to connect it here, that <coughs> Indra was a student in Gautam's Gurukul, Rishi Gautam's Gurukul. And Ahalya was very, very beautiful, being brought up at that point of time as Guru, uh, Gautam Rishi's daughter. So you see this whole thing about Gautam Rishi's daughter and then Gautam Rishi getting married to uh, Ahalya. I mean, I've tried to introduce that there has to be a psychological traumatic moment in a girl's life to sort of accept the person who was your father till uh, yesterday is now the husband uh, from today. The girl has to go through a traumatic uh, sense. And not only that, the huge age gap. There was a huge age gap. Here is a Gautam Rishi who's, you know, who's focusing on scriptures, texts. That was, he was writing a text. I'm unable to recollect the name. It is believed that he was writing a text. And that's what his focus was. Led to a young girl whose life is very different. She's not given to scriptures at that young age of hers. She's at a stage of exploration. She's at a stage of bringing out her own emotions and exploring the womanhood in her. At that stage when a handsome king uh, of the gods, most handsome god comes and says that I want to make love with you, she doesn't say no. And in the entire narrative, it is never shown as anything wrong. She never says sorry. She never apologizes. Nobody ever apologizes. It's just Gautam Rishi who brings up this question by saying that you are married. And a married woman wanting to sleep with another man is questionable. And when you know, and then later on we have this whole story coming up that you know Indra actually came in a disguise, so Ahalya could not recognize. But you see, in both the stories, the punishment for Ahalya is the same. So if she went voluntarily, if she agreed to sleep with Indra voluntarily, then she's turned into a stone. And if she was deceived, she still turned into a stone. Now, here is an important debate here that no matter what happens, the punishment for the woman remains the same, mistake or voluntarily. So the society is telling something here that, yes, the narrative got changed because Probably by the time you were 12th and 13th century, you know, the storytellers were not comfortable to say that she went voluntarily. She knew what she was getting into. So that would probably throw a wrong impression on the society. So they changed that part and said, well, she got deceived because Indra came in a disguise. But then what happened to the uh, punishment? The punishment remains as severe as that. There's an interesting uh, question here or a comment here. You see, uh, in the Manu Smriti or in one of these texts, uh, that is why there was this uh, 
there was this 21 year range that was prescribed that you know your athletic eyes could move 21 years up or 21 years you know down so if a girl is 21 years younger to you then she has to be treated like a daughter and if a, if someone is 21 years elder to you then it has to be treated as a mother so that that range was then created to to avoid or or, or maybe it was maybe this maybe this drew from this story you know Possibly. maybe I, I wouldn't know. But you but know, remember. You know, because <laughs> that, that would have put some automatic because uh, the moment, you know, the, the age gap between these two must have been more than 21 years. Much so more, in, much more. Much more, right? So uh, Gautam was very old. Like, he was an old man. Like, it's like, you know, marrying your granddaughter, perhaps. So. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and absolutely. then she still had that sort of power to uh, enforce it, you know. And the, and the legend and the myth is that she actually got turned into stone. So that's the, yeah. that's so the other part. It, it's, it's also, if you see, there is also another angle that I, I, I'm exploring in the book that could this be seen as also a kind of the power that the sages and the Brahmin community uh, had on a society? That if they could, if they could curse a god and get away with it, that shows them who's on the top hierarchy then. We always believe that the Kshatriyas were, were important. We also believe that the gods were important. If they were important, then how is it that the sages were able to curse a god, which, which, which Gautam does in the, in the case of, uh, in the case of uh, uh, Indra? So here there is also a bit of a power equation, uh, which you have to understand. Because remember, the society is in a state of flux. It's changing. Too many rapid changes are happening. In, in that scenario, you'll see in your narrative, subtly telling you something about the society at that point of time. And that's what one is trying, one must see through that. See, when we're reading mythology, then it's not just the story and say, achhi hai ya achhi nahi hai. You know, there are two ways of looking at it. You'll say, oh, I love the story. Then you'll say, oh, this is ridiculous. What kind of a silly story is this? But remember that the myths are telling you something. They're not just, they're not just weaving yarns. They're telling you something. Either they're telling you the state of the society or they're telling you what is expected out of the members of the society. I mean, if Ram, uh, you know, closes his eyes and moment he hears Kaike, uh, you know, talk about her uh, boon and he decides to go to the forest without even his father talking to him about the fact that you should go to the forest or you shouldn't go to the forest. It's, 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 it's Valmiki telling that that's expected out of a son, you know, a, 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 a vow taken by the father. It is imperative on the son to follow it. That's this message that is being given by Ram following that stricture, even when he's not been told, rather Dashrath tells him, don't go. But he says, no, I will go. Okay, that, and that's how you get your terms like Raghukul Reet Chali Aai, Pran Jai, Parvachan Na Jai. Now, these are being told to the society. These are being kind of ingrained in the system that, look, this is how the society is expected to kind of conduct itself. Sadhgarsh, so, uh when we began, I mean, you talked about how you conceived of Indra as this god who was god in Rigveda, but later, you know, he becomes a deva who's ridiculed also. But in the book, the story of Ushas and Indra, if I have to take that story, where Ushas and Indra, they have an episode, they don't like each other. Uh, Indra proves his strength over Usha, but when Usha is captured by Vala, he's He's very angry and he has to rescue her. But when he rescues her, even then, at the end, you know, he doesn't he he doesn't regret his decision of building Usha. It's like, huh, matlab maine kiya. So I mean, you know, there's some kind of dichotomy here where you know he's he comes across as a misogynist in some ways. Please talk about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to put me in a uh, in a spot. I can see, but let me let me bring this thing. These two stories have been kind of standalone stories. Let me tell you the first one. The first one brings in a very very important aspect about uh, the way the culture was shaping up. There is no reason given why Indra did not like Usha. Rather, there is no there is no chemistry between the two, which is good or bad. There's just one episode that Usha, uh, Indra, when he's crossing the street, he sees Usha and he rams. And the word direct translation from Sanskrit is that he rams his chariot into her. She gets thrown away and then she just runs away from there. Now, the way we interpret the conflict 
and there no rhyme or reason for not liking Usha. It's very simple. It's the it's 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 the clash of cults. Remember, every society, every society at the initial stage was a matriarchal society. Remember, the men were going out battling, uh, you know, earning bread, uh, shikar, so that they can get food. Women stayed back. And that's what gave them a big uh, importance. So many of the cults, be it Mesopotamia, be it uh, uh, Greece, be it India, be it any country you look at, they all were matriarchal societies. But soon, patriarchy was gaining ground. And how do you show this? For example, I, I was talking to you the other day. In Mesopotamia, we have this classic cult uh, uh, clash between Tiamat and Marduk. Tiamat represents the old uh, mother goddess cult, for, uh, cult and Marduk is the new age uh, uh, god who simply tears the Tiamat to pieces, right? And, and that's an important aspect of the story. Look at the Greek, Gaia. Gaia was the first one who gives birth to everybody. But who is the boss uh, in, the later, in the later time? It's Zeus. So the clash of how did you eliminate the elimination of a matriarchal society by patriarchy is what this whole clash between Ushas and Indras to be seen as. Again, it's a very small hymn. It's a very small hymn. Uh, later on, when we uh, when we look at him trying uh, saving, is again a very different emotion. I I know it doesn't sound nice, but that's how it is. And, I, and misogyny is probably uh, the right word. I can do what I want to do with my woman, but I can't let somebody else mess around with my woman. So ill-treating is only my prerogative. It's not a foreigner's prerogative. So, you know, I might not be treating my women in my home very uh, nicely, but if there's an outsider who comes and insults my, my wife or my mother or my daughter, I'll take up cudgels on, on their behalf. And once it's done, I might not still go back to look at them. So I think it's, it's, it's basically showing but somewhere, if you read the words closely, there is also a, an unexplained behavior, unexplained emotion where Indra is unable to con, uh, conjure up as to what is he feeling? Good, bad, guilty, arrogant? You know, he, he has this, if in the text at least I've tried to put in that he doesn't know. Having saved Ushas uh, rightfully, what does he now feel? Does he does he walk up? Uh, does he want to walk up and say sorry for the past? No, because he hasn't even realized that what he did was right or wrong. He's a brash uh, uh, person. You know, he doesn't think. Varun is the one who thinks. Indra doesn't think. He, it's a typical hunter gatherer uh, kind of a mentality. Just do it. You know, it's a typical uh, hunter-gatherer. If you if you see the uh, logic, it's very much like that. No thinking uh, capable. Just do it. So right hair, wrong hair. He's not thinking. You're a storyteller, Utkarsh. You've written a small line in the book, and I want to know the story. Indra cuts the wings of the mountains. That's all that that, that is in the book. What's the feature of the story? Yeah, it's a very interesting story. It's a very small story, but nonetheless. So it is believed that in earlier days, uh, very, very early days, uh, mountains had wings and they would keep flying all over the place on their whims and fancy. Now that was creating a lot of problem because so that would probably spoil the crops or sometimes the, the, the sages are doing their yagna and you know, wo disturb ho jata hai. so you can't have mountains just flying all over the place, right? And disturbing them. So people approach, uh, I mean, the sages and everybody approached Indra and Indra came with a solution. So what he does is he goes and clips the wings of the mountains. So since then the mountains are steady, but what happens to the wings? The wings have become clouds. And even today you'll find these clouds clinging onto the mountains. Okay, like, like the erstwhile wings of, uh, uh, of the mountains. So that's the story. And since then it is believed that thanks to Indra, the mountains are steady. And uh, but that uh, celestial romance exists that the clouds are still clinging up to the mountains like they were the wings. <laughs> There's that uh, uh, that Indra then marries Indrani, so which means that you know the uh, the matrimonial relationship, <coughs> romance between the devas, the daityas, the rakshasas. So they're not really different, different in that sense. No, uh, no, no, they are not. They are not. Part of the same homo sapiens sapiens. Absolutely. This is a different community. Different 
communities and different tribes. Uh, but it, and therefore, the, the expression that we have used for Dhanavas and Rakshasas, that's a much later day uh, accretion. True. Is that what, what you would uh, say? True. Also, also, this whole thing about Rakshasas having fangs and horns yes. is a much later iconographic, uh, uh, I must say, murder of a community. Uh, mm -hmm. That they would have uh, dark features and big mustaches and you know horns and I think it's it's just a it's just a way to show that they were different, you know, from the devas and that's why you know you'll always have this different. But no, rakshasas were just a different community. Yes, the whole concept of fair and lovely starts from there. <laughs> yeah, I guess it starts from there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, over Another to you. Back to yeah. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. sir. So the concept of new emerging gods, I found that very interesting. The new gods, gods and the old gods. You know, we have this a drama on American television about the new gods and the old gods. When I read it, I was like, you know, I was there. We talk about all of this, but uh, this was new to me. You know, I mean, we do understand that God, we have a lot of gods are like gods. I didn't have this concept that we uh, go because again, devas are in categories. So hmm. this to me came as a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, narrative. So we talk about it a little. See, you have to understand one thing that when a civilization or when a culture is taking shape, right, there is a belief system, right? We created gods the way we understood. So if you look at the Vedic gods, they're all gods of elements. So you have a Vayu, uh, you have, uh, uh, then you have uh, Varun, water. Then you have Indra, the heavens, right? Uh, sky, rather. Then you have Agni, the fire. Now, all these gods are elemental gods. But, and, and probably that was the perception that early man had, right? And that's how these gods got created. When you need something, you create. For example, uh, uh, you know, in the initial stages of agricultural uh, setup, rains were important for people, right? So you worshipped Indra because he was important. Plus, remember, he also represented the warrior clan. So he was battling people, uh, 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 I mean, Vritra and Namochi, etc, etc. Because when a society is settling down, might is right. And that's what the god is trying to impress, that I need to get land, I need to get more animals and spread the boundaries. So that's why Indra is so much of a battle. So there is no other mention of Indra except him battling uh, Vritra, then you know Vala, then Namuchi, etc., etc., because he's expanding, right? And everybody's and, and if if Indra is the one who's trying to expand his uh, uh, borders, there are others also who are trying to do that. So how, I'm also trying to do the same thing. You're also trying to do the same thing. So one of us has to be eliminated. So you'll find those stories. But when a society settles down, when a society's needs have evolved, then our gods also change. Right. So by the time we move into post Vedic era, you see, we, we have turned more philosophical. There is less battles happening. You won't find, uh, uh, you know, too many battles. Uh, Shiva is not fighting any battles. Vishnu is fighting individual uh, Asuras, but he's not fighting battles. Battles are over. We are not fighting any major battles. Whereas, and, and these gods are now even giving you a lot of philosophical input. They're talking about philosophy, they're talking of ideals, they're talking about values, which the earlier gods were not. You won't have an Indra giving you lecture on value system or you know on what is right, what is wrong, because for him might was right, because that was how the society was at that point of time. You know, the, the whole if you if you see it as hunter-gatherer society and then pastoral and then uh, settling down. So by the time we move into the times of Krishna, and you know, the Govardhan Parvat is a classic example, where he simply says that we don't need to worship a guy like Indra, who's sending rains, because rains are thanks to the mountain, which is arresting the clouds. And, and Govardhan gives us more uh, medicinal plants, so on and so forth. So let's stop. So you see, here is the elimination or, you know, the, the importance of an Indra going down. And even in one place, you'll find in the chapter, it says that no battles happening. With no battles happening, everybody settling down, the role of the army has come down. The role of the army has come down, the role of the army general has come down. So then somebody else is emerging and that's how we have new gods. Let me give you an example. When we were young, you know, we had this goddess called Sitla Mata. You know, it was a goddess of chicken pox. 
whenever we had chicken pox, our parents probably took us to the temple, right? Do you take your child to the chicken pox temple any uh, uh, Sitla Mata temple anymore? No, you'll take him him or her to the doctor. So the god of the the disease gods that we had, like Sitla, then um, Sashti, these goddesses have been eliminated. We don't worship them anymore. We look at new gods, right? We are looking at different gods now. We are not looking at Sitla. So those goddesses and gods have gone. So the Vedic gods, if you see, nobody, have you seen a temple of Indra? Have you seen a temple of Varun? Have you seen a temple of Agni? Why? No, they were not there. But amongst the Vedic, we still follow one god and that is Agni. That's because the whole concept of rituals continued with us and no ritual is complete without a Yagna or a Havan. Havan means Agni. So Agni is the, probably the only god who still has some level of importance. But again, still has a second uh, second grade importance when you compare it with you know a vishnu or a shiva uh, who are still your main gods so this whole concept is emerges out of human need your needs will define your gods during the covid people even tried to create a corona goddess or a god whatever it just didn't work out right so we are in the process of creating gods whenever we get the first opportunity to do that so if you're doing it now people then also did it and as and when your 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 requirements have been taken care of, you don't need them. You create you leave them. Santoshi, you know, seventy five. Me Santoshi Mata, you know, was was at the peak. Everybody was doing those uh, Shola Shukravar ke vrat, so on and so forth. Temples were coming up, praying. Ab koi nahi kar raha hai. Till you, you know, you 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 sort of outdo that. Shani Dev is coming. Shani Dev is coming. Sunny Dev is uh, coming. Yes, Sunny Dev people still believe. Some of them, some of them still believe. Yes. So it's it's all, all a matter of time, you know. All a matter of time. All a matter of. Time. It's been a very very nice moment. We spent thirty seven minutes. There are three questions yeah. that are already there, and then Sunny. So we'll extend it by another five or seven minutes. We'll sure. Like Forty five minutes. The question to you, Karsh. One is, you know, that uh, how long does it take for you to research a particular book? The second question is also related. How do you choose which of the which of the many uh, you know gods, goddesses, characters that you would take up, uh, and also about audio books and things, which I'm sure you'll be doing audio books. But uh, the fact that how do you choose your mythological characters, and how long does it take for you to research? Uh, it takes me very very long. I'm very slow. It takes me a long time to research because. Uh, I mean, and that probably comes from my background that since I'm, I'm a teacher, I, I'm a lecturer on mythology, so I have to be also very careful uh, on what I write. You know, I just don't, I, I don't like to weave fantasy. And also it's very important for me to try to make it more acceptable, try to make it more believable. You know, if, if, if I want to make a story, I'm not, I'm not making my characters fly. You know, I'm not making my characters sit on a magic carpet and, you know, go wherever they want to, because it doesn't really make sense to me. So I'm trying to make it more, uh, as much believable as possible and that does take me a long time plus reading uh you know uh, researching it so that i can especially in this particular case for example it took me a very very long time because rigved is not uh you know it's it's not a sequence so there is one one hymn uh you know a, in, in at a place and then the 10th hymn is somewhere else and 25th hymn is somewhere else now to put all those hymns together so that i can make a narrative I think that 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 is what uh, took me a very very long time. So yes, research takes me a long time. How do I choose uh, my characters? Well, um, the character has to really interest me. For example, if certain characters I and the character has to be wronged. Personally, I feel if the character has got a raw deal uh, by uh, by the sages and by the critics and by the authors, I would want to uh, write about it. So when I wrote Shakuntala, I was really disappointed. Uh, you know. With the way, of course, Abhigya Chakudalam is a brilliant piece of literature. Having said that, uh, that character is such a far cry from the original Shakuntala, which Vyas had created. So I felt that, you know, this is a story that needs to be told. So that's how I choose my uh, characters. So Dushyant won't come in your scheme of things. Well, uh, Dushyant won't get the significance that Kalidas Ji has given him. He he he, he gets uh, he doesn't get that importance at all. Definitely not. <laughs> You know, so, before we let you go, sorry, sir. So you had no, yeah, there was, there was a third question. I'm sorry, I can't. What was the third question? It was, it was linked, you know, linked, you know, about audio books, you know, and uh, 
Uh, no, you? I haven't done any of them, but uh, yeah, given the chance, I would definitely look at it. Now, these are these are the three questions that have come okay. up so far. Sure. But uh, would be uh, Shalini, we can carry on for another four or five minutes. Like maybe we'll yeah, go there. Yeah, so many now. questions, sir. But uh, we have to let him go. And uh, yeah. this is one question which I have to ask you: Why did you become a mythologist? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Yes, that's a good question. Um, well, it wasn't a very conscious uh, decision, frankly. But yes, mythology uh, had always impressed me right from the very beginning, even when I didn't know there was much to it, uh, till I realized that there was mu so much to it. So as a kid, I would always read and I would have a lot of these questions. Uh, SAQ, SAQ, ye galat hai. you know, this God uh, shouldn't have done this, this God shouldn't have said this, those kind of things I had. But then when I got into reading it and then i started understanding what myth is i i found it's a it's 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 a very very big world and unfortunately in our country today you know i feel that a lot of misunderstanding is creeping in um in the name of mythology right we have to accept that myths have passed their stage you know you really it's good to follow the stories but to think that we must be following the same principles and the same values even today is probably not going to work. And that's where the clash will happen, as uh, always it has happened. Myths need to be debated, discussed, and talked about, not to be bundled up uh, you know, in, in, in a cloth and kept it aside. All myths need to be debated. And I think that's what made me find this interesting, that let's understand our stories. Let's understand the stories from the world. Why only Indian stories? From across the world. And you will see that the world, even then, thought in a common way. Humanity has similar problems. So it's not that the Greek uh, thought of anything differently and then from the Mesopotamians and the Mesopotamians thought of something very different from the Indians. The concerns, the issues, the beliefs, they were all the same. And that's why you'll find so much of similarity in the narratives. And I found it's a huge world to know and tell and help people understand the myths the way they ought to be, not the way they are being done right now. Tell me, uh, apart from the University of Bombay or, or the University of Mumbai, which are the other places where uh, our readers can, you know, uh, our listeners can perhaps pursue a program in, in mythology? So in and India, they don't have a course. Uh, in India, they don't have anywhere a course. But frankly, what we are now trying to do is that introduce modules at certain places. So, uh, but as such, nobody is teaching mythology the way Mumbai University's Sanskrit department is teaching today. So this course is under Sanskrit department, but the way they are teaching, like a full course, you can just come and learn mythology and go. You know, there's no need to do anything else. And that to comparative mythology, which is another very important thing to understand that it's not just Indian mythology. Here, when we are teaching, we're teaching comparative mythology from across the world. So that is a rare thing not happening anywhere as far as I know in India. But many of this uh, liberal arts colleges and schools and colleges have now introduced uh, a module. So uh, like uh, the film school in Pune, uh, the film schools in Bombay, the drama school in Bombay, these have all introduced a module whereby, you know, we are introducing the whole concept of myths and mythology and folklore, uh, which is a huge body of work, you know, uh, uh, which storytellers must explore and learn more about it and help interpret, not just read the story. You need to read between the lines because these some of these stories are full of allegories and symbolism. Absolutely. So you to, uh, these have also yeah. helped us to evolve our Riti Nritya. They have also helped us to evolve Riti Natya. And you know, you'll be happy to know, Karsh, that you know, this time uh, uh, together with Shalini, in fact, Shalini is curating an entire program for Dehradun schools, which is based on Abhiganam Shakuntala. So, you know, wow. we get schools to participate uh, either in the entire play or for parts of the play. And we're doing it in three languages, uh, English, Hindi, and Sanskrit. And the and the number of schools who are interested in doing it in Sanskrit is, is phenomenal. I mean, you know, schools wanting to do uh, these plays in Sanskrit. Uh, so I'm so glad that we have today with us both Utkarsh and Chalini. Uh, friends, you're most welcome to send us your questions. You can send them on email or on WhatsApp. Uh, and, and we'll be referring them to Utkarsh. And we do hope that our association continues. Thank you, Utkarsh. God bless you. You. And you write more, you write many more stories. Thank you, Shalini, for putting us in touch with Utkarsh. And I've done a review of Utkarsh's work, which is available on our website. Uh, so please go through that. Please also go through Utkarsh's writing. Thank you once again. 
pleasure we'll see you again next month bye bye thank you everybody and thank you value of words for calling me thank you thank you